everyone, my name is Laura. I'm a librarian for the Ocean County Library. So welcome to Here They Come, the Spring Migration, part of the Ocean County Library Bird Watching Essential series. I would like to introduce today, we have Susan Pewter. She's going to be presenting on the spring migration. Susan has been a serious nature and wildlife photographer for over 30 years. She is a dedicated environmentalist who supports the preservation of open lands and wildlife. As an avid birder, she started the Southern Ocean Birding Group located at the Tuckerton Seaport in Tuckerton, New Jersey, and is a member of the New Jersey Audubon Society. New Jersey Birds and Beyond is her first published book, which is available through the Ocean County Library with your Ocean County Library card. So, Susan, please take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully everybody can hear me. Okay, just a, a, again, probably reiterating some of what uh, has been previously said. I am the founder and president of Southern Ocean Birding Group. I'm a board member of the Friends of Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge. I'm also a volunteer master naturalist at Forsyth. I'm a presenter and judge for New Jersey Federation of Camera Clubs and a field contributor to Nature Photographer Magazine. Uh, that's a copy of my book over there. And again, it's at the library, but also um, you can purchase one from me. And my website is listed below, um, which is eaglecreekphotos.com. Okay, uh, migration. Okay, let's say you're a person who spends your uh, winters in Florida, and you live in New Jersey. So you're going to go down uh, probably I-95, and you're going to head to Florida. You need a map to tell you where to go. And some of the things, you, you know, you might drive for a few hours or six, eight hours are usually what people drive. And then you want to stop at a motel. And so you're going to rest up there. You're going to grab something to eat. You've got to get some gas. And then you might even stay there an extra day or two, and then you're going to head on down to Florida. Come spring, you're going to do the process in reverse, and you're going to come back up uh, to New Jersey, and you're going to do the same thing. You're going to stop, and you're going to rest, and you're going to get some food. And that's basically what birds do. Um, and what they use is flyways, which you can think of as just like a... Um, a highway for birds. And there's four major high, uh, flyways in the United States or in North America. We have the Atlantic Flyway, which is between uh, the Atlantic Ocean and the Appalachian Mountains. Now you'll notice that these flyways are all divided by a geological or a geographical uh, barrier uh, that birds don't want to go over. So um, for the Atlantic one is the Atlantic Ocean and the uh, Appalachian Mountains, which run along from Georgia all the way up to Maine. The next one is the Mississippi Flyway, which runs along the Mississippi River Valley from Louisiana all the way up through to Canada. The Central Flyway is between the Mississippi Flyway and the Mississippi Valley and these over here, which would be Rocky Mountains. And then the final flyway is the Pacific flyway. All right, so this is just some illustrations that were from uh, National Geographic or uh, um, Migratory Bird Day, just showing you that a lot of birds are traveling down and they go down in the winter to Central and South America. And they are taking these flyways. And you can see here how they, a lot of them go down and come back, and they're like they look like the spaghetti listing of our inter, interstate highways going uh, north and south. Uh, New Jersey and migration. Well, there's over 900 birds that can be found in North America. Uh, in New Jersey, we have about 445, about 450 birds that can be seen in New Jersey, which is almost half of what's in North America. So it's really a great place. Uh, to see birds, and about 50% of, 50 of those are migratory birds. 
as I said, New Jersey is situated on the Atlantic Flyway. And not only that, we're almost halfway between the, uh, the equator and the Arctic Circle. So we're in a great position. We're between, sort of in the middle between those two areas of, of, of um, demarcation, the Arctic Circle and the equator, but we're also on the Atlantic Flyway because we're right on the, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, bird migration is at its height in spring and fall. Um, New Jersey locations provide food and resting areas for tens of thousands of birds during migrations. And some of the best locations, and we'll probably be going over this multiple times, um, just to give you an idea, would be Cape May, Sandy Hook, Garrett Mountain, which is in uh, Patterson, uh, Bell Plain State Forest is in Cape May County, uh, Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge, which extends from Oceanville all the way up to Brick. So that's um, one of the largest national wildlife refuges in the Northeast and also the Delaware Bay Shore. So why do birds migrate? Why do people go to Florida in this winter? Well, they're looking for food and nesting locations. Uh, they move from areas of low resources to areas of higher increasing resources. Um, you can think of winter. Are there, a lot of our birds are insect eaters. Are there a lot of insects out in the winter? Not really. And they have to go where the food is. A lot of birds eat seeds. There's not a lot of seeds in the winter either. So that's one of the reasons they would be moving. Uh, birds in the Northern Hemisphere tend to head north in the spring for increasing insects, budding plants, and nesting sites. And then they'll head south um, in the fall because insects numbers are going down, the, wind, the temperature's getting colder, etc. As fall and winter approaches, they head south as food sources become limited up here. And there's certain ways that birds migrate. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. This is very odd for me because I usually do this in front of people and I can get some reactions. I'm not, you know, I don't see. Okay, seasonal. Seasonal changes, uh, birds are moving from breeding, uh, from breeding and non-breeding ranges. So in the, they're leaving their non-breeding ranges in the, in the spring and they're moving north for breeding. Uh, latitudinal, uh, it's the difference between latitudes from the Arctic to the tropics and vice versa. Um, that's probably spelled wrong. Um, that's what it is in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, in North America, our birds move lati latitudinally. They have longitudinally tudinal, um, between the different longitudes and that's east to west and west to east. And that's very common in Europe. altitudinal, which is in mountains, and they may go lower elevations away from snow or harsh weather uh, in the winter. Some birds have uh, been to some of the mountain areas in Colorado and uh, Arizona. Uh, the birds you'll see up there in the winter are not what you would see there in the spring or fall. Because, the, of course, it gets covered with snow, there's nothing for them to eat. Uh, they loop. These birds follow two distinct paths for spring and fall migration. Um, and some, uh, some like the Rufus hummingbird uh, on the West Coast, they're a West Coast bird, though we usually get one or two of them here in the uh, fall. In the spring, they go from Mexico up to Alaska, but they follow the coastline going up. But coming back down in the fall, they head inland and they take advantage of fall wildflowers on the way back. So they do a loop. Um, uh, black poles do the same thing. They'll go inland along the, um, usually along our bay, um, coastal areas coming back south, but it, in the spring they go up usually along the uh, Mississippi Flyway. And there's nomadic, uh, that's erratic due to food sources. So they might completely avoid a normal area if there's no food, but come back when sources are available and waxwings are um, 
an example of birds that might do that. And then there's eruptive, and we'll cover this a little bit later. Uh, highly unpredicted, predictable, uh, spectacular migrations uh, in search for suitable food and water sources. <clears throat> a great example of this is snowy owls. Uh, this past winter, we had red-breasted nuthatches, we had red poles, we had crossbills. These are usually birds that are up in the uh, boreal forest during the winter. There's usually enough food up there for them. But every two or three years, we find them coming down and uh, giving us a big thrill down here in New Jersey when they come down during the winter. Uh, there's different migratory um, patterns that they follow. There's permanent residents. Uh, they don't migrate. They can find adequate food during winter. Uh, cardinals, crows, some blue jays, some bluebirds or like that, they will not, they can find enough food during the winter or people put out suet or bird feeders in the winter, those birds will stay uh, in New Jersey. <clears throat> then we have short distance migrants. They're permanent residents, but they might migrate to the edges of their range, like uh, Bob White or Harry Woodpeckers. Uh, they might go maybe just south to even just Maryland or Delaware, or maybe just to the outskirts of New Jersey. Um, I think something would be uh, like um, dark-eyed juncos. Uh, those uh, will breed up in our northern um, Sussex County area, but during this, the winter, they'll come down to South Jersey and we'll find them always at our feeders. Uh, medium distant migrants range over a large part of the US and Canada. But they remain in North America. They don't go into Central or South America. Uh, blue jays, bluebirds, killdeer, osprey. A lot of our osprey go down to Florida and the Caribbean uh, during the winter. Uh, hummingbirds uh, will stay in North America because a lot of them go to Mexico. And then we have our long distance migrants and they cover thousands of miles. They take many days or weeks to complete a migration. And we'll talk a little bit about what an example of those would be. Uh, time of day, when to migrate. Uh, we have uh, diurnal migrants fly during the day. So that's diurnal. Uh, some shorebirds do that. Almost all hawks and raptors fly during the day. They migrate during the day. Ducks and geese migrate during the day. And some songbirds do, um, especially for hawks and raptors they need the thermals to help them move. Um, thermals are the air currents that go up from the earth and you'll see them soaring around in them and then they can use the thermals. They go from one thermal, they head towards another one and they use the air pressure uh, to help them migrate along. Um, especially in the fall, you can see a lot of them if you go down to Cape May during the fall uh, raptor migration. And you can see them building in the thermals start around 10 o'clock or so in the uh, morning. And you can see the uh, raptors starting to take off and get into that, into those thermals. The nocturnal migrants fly at night. That's most songbirds. That includes warblers, vireos, thrushes, sparrows. Um, they fly at night because uh, the atmosphere is more stable. It's cooler and they have a smoother fright. It's cooler, they're not uh, worrying about having to keep their body temperature cooler. And also there's no predators because A, the hawks and raptors are all flying during the day. So that's a big advantage for them to go at night because um, they don't have to worry about anything diving in to grab them. Uh, we do have some uh, raptors like night uh, night jars that fly at night, but they're usually they're insect eaters, so our birds don't have to worry about them. And they also use the stars and magnetic fields to navigate at night. Um, if you're diurnal and you're flying during the day, you can find landmarks because uh, you can see them. And a landmark could be going up along the Delaware um, River Valley. Uh, so they can see the river valley going north and they know which way to go. Uh, they can use even the, the parkway 
there's a north-south road that they could use as a, as a uh, landmark for going up uh, north. Uh, they can go along the coastline and use our coast so they can see them. Now, um, migrants that fly at night uh, use the stars, they use the sun, and they use magnetic field to navigate. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. I see there's a question, let's see. Uh, uh, somebody asked, why am I seeing so many robins now? I, only, I saw only. Uh, well, our robins are um, coming in uh, in the spring. Our robins that are here during the summer uh, will migrate south, and the ones we're getting are coming down from New England. So those robins have moved out, and uh, our southern robins that usually stay in New Jersey and breed uh, are coming in, and robins are don't have much of a problem for survival. Um, they're probably one of the more populated birds that we have. So you will see a lot of them, especially in the evening. They go out and really uh, go on people's lawns and uh, get their worms and grubs that they eat there. All right, spring stopover stops, stopover sites or um, an area like we use a motel. Uh, they use for refueling, they use them for resting, and they use them for staging. Sometimes you'll get uh, groups of uh, uh, some birds are coming in from different locations in the south, and then they group together in certain areas. Um, and they also uh, use for diversity of habitat. Now, when we talk about habitat, um, the definition would be a place where an organism lives permanently or temporarily, that's 50% of our birds are temporarily here, which provides things that need it for the organism, organism's survival and ultimate, ultimately reproduction. Uh, so we have a very much a diversity of, of habitat here in New Jersey. We have um, Ridge and Valley up in uh, Sussex and Warren counties. That's where our mountains and forests are. Dense, that's where the most dense, dense uh, forests in New Jersey are located. We have the highlands and the sourdough mountains, which are part of um, Huntington County and part of Passaic County. Uh, we have the Piedmont Plateau, which is part of Bergen all the way down to Mercer and Huntington counties. Um, Different habitats. Uh, some highlands have some some forests. They have some grasslands. The Piedmont Pl Plateau has a lot of uh, grassland areas, or used to before New Jersey starts getting built out. Uh, and then we have the intercoastal plain, which is a very narrow thing, but uh, goes actually from Sandy Hook area all the way down to the Delaware Bay shores almost. And, uh, and then we have the outer coastal plain, which is probably the largest area. And of course, during the glacial period, like 10, 12,000 years ago, that was all covered in glaciers and water. And um, when the glaciers uh, retreated, uh, we have the pine lands down there. That's the biggest area down there. And also our coastal areas with our uh, barrier islands. So these are a bunch of different kinds of habitat that we have in New Jersey. Uh, Spring stopover sites, another term for stock over sites would be uh, migrant traps. I mean, we're not really trapping them, but they see an area that they want to drop into um, once they're flying. If they're flying at night, they could be flying eight to 10 hours at night. And they really need a place then to drop in during um, that sunrise. And they need to rest, they need to eat, they need to get some water. Um, and they might stay there for uh, you know, a day or two, three days before they need to, to continue on to their um, areas uh, north of us. Uh, some stopovers are the Wallkill River Valley, which is up in this area here, uh, the Highlands. Uh, Kitty Taylor Ridge is along the Delaware River area. Delaware Bay Shore can go from, from almost Trenton all the way down to Cape May. It's a large area. And then the peninsula of Cape May. 
Now, if you think about it, New Jersey is actually a peninsula because we have, we're only attached to the rest of the uh, United States from, and the New York, almost Pennsylvania border up here. The rest of us is all, we're all surrounded by water, either the ocean, um, I guess this is uh, Raritan Bay, and we have the Delaware River, and then we also have the Delaware Bay. So a lot of people don't think of New Jersey like that because we have so, we're so populated and we have so many bridges going everywhere. Uh, and they also use, they can see, now scientists are saying that there's possible proteins in the eyes of birds that allow them to see the magnetic field along with sensing it. And if you look at these, they use a filter to sort of trying to describe it to people uh, to get a, a sense of what birds might be able to see in their eyes. And if you look at west, you go northwest, it's very similar, but not quite the same. North, you just watch the white line here. It's a little bit straight here, diagonal. This gets a little curved. This is sort of in the center. And then northeast has a dripping down again. And then the east would be uh, the diagonal going the other way, like the west. Um, they've been doing a lot of scientific research on this. And, um, you know, this is, this is something relatively new. Uh, they knew they could sense they could sense the magnetic field, but actually being able to see it or get some sort of concept of it uh, with their, whatever's in their eyes is, uh, I, I find it really fascinating. So I talked about Northern Cardinal and that's not a bird that normally would, um, would migrate. And if you go on to eBird, there's some really great uh, tools there and one of them is giving you a distribution map. Uh, so this is what, I'm gonna hit it again, and that should, you can see that there's hardly any change. This is going through, if you see the chart on the right, it's showing you the, the months of the year and how the migration of a cardinal is. And let's play that again. And you'll see that the distribution of the cardinal is basically the same, it's on the Eastern part they go almost up to Colorado and the foothills of the Rockies, but they're an Eastern bird and they'll stay with us uh, year round. Another bird that's, that's a migrant, um, which I find fascinating. My favorite birds are the hummingbirds. And here in the East, we have one that's um, native to our area, which is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Um, they're, they weigh about the same, so, same weight as a nickel. And these birds will fly uh, in the spring over the Gulf of Mexico. And they fattened up in Mexico before they leave and they'll get over within 36 to 48 hours, nonstop because there's not any islands in the Gulf of Mexico. And by that time, they've lost a lot, all their fat, body fat, and also their organs are starting to shrink. Uh, so they have enough energy just to get over uh, to um, the United States from their, their wintering grounds in Mexico. So we're gonna show another one of their maps. And you see this there in basically in Yucatan, uh, a little bit into some of Central America, but mostly in Mexico. And this is in January. So if you watch the distribution, you'll see that they're moving. Um, and then how they automatically pop up in North America, or the United States is that they've crossed over the, the Gulf of Mexico. And then they head back down in the uh, October, I believe is when they're starting to head back down to, um, down to Mexico. And usually the parents leave first if you are lucky to have some uh, hummingbird feeders out there. You might not have seen them recently, um, but they should be appearing now because when the young or uh, June, early July is when the young are being fed by the adults and they usually don't go to feeders. They're getting insects to feed the young, but the young should start fledging anytime now and you'll see them at your feeders. So make sure you keep them fresh. Uh, 
one part sugar, four parts water. Do not put any of that red coloring in them. Um, just with the heat, you need to replenish them um, so the, the water doesn't get stale with the sugar, you know, every couple of days. But you should start seeing them. And then the adults will leave in early September or so, and the youngsters stay around for another couple of weeks before they head out down there. And the parents leave, and the kids know automatically where to go. So here's a little bit of something about the migration range. We saw that illustrated um, here in March 1st. They're just coming into um, you know, our southern states, Louisiana, Alabama, um, Florida area. That's just when they're just starting to arrive. Uh, March 10th, they're starting to move in a little bit. Uh, their western edge is uh, basically the Mississippi uh, Valley area. And by May 1st, uh, the end of April, May 1st, they should be in New Jersey. Uh, some will go all the way up to Maine. Uh, not that many, but some will. So this gives you an idea of when to put your feeders out. Um, usually about the end or middle of, um, about the middle of April is a good time to put your feeders out. Now, of course, migration times are changing now because of climate change, which we'll, we'll get to in a moment. So here's the abundance, all right? The relatively abundant season, breeding season is usually from June 7th to July 27th. That's usually when they're, they've um, fledged. Non-breeding is December 7th through March 1st. That's when they're still down in Mexico. Uh, Pre-breeding season is when they're migrating north is from March 8th to May 31st. And post-breeding would be from uh, say August 3rd to November 30th, they're not going to be having laying chicks there. And you wonder how we get that information. Um, we have a lot of citizen scientists are, uh, that give information to eBird, which is a um, application and a study that's done by Cornell uh, Ornithological Lab. And there's tons of information on there. I'm not going to go, you know, I could spend a whole hour just talking about what you could do with eBird but um, it's ebird.com. And uh, this is where I got a lot of this information from. So then we also have our neotropical migrants. And these, there's about 350 birds that fall into this category. They winter all the way down into Brazil, uh, Central and South America. Um, some like our red knot go all the way down to the end of, Central, of South America to Tierra de Fuego. Um, the Baltimore Orioles, a lot of people have been seeing them in spring blue winged teal, painted bunting. We don't usually get a lot of painted buntings in New Jersey. Magnolia warblers we do. Swainson's hawk is mostly a Western bird and as is the Western tanager. But these birds um, are always down, they always winter down in Central and South America. A uh, range where you talk about the Baltimore Oriole. A lot of people have been seeing them this, this spring. Um, percentage of the region of New Jersey that has non-breeding, this is in the winter, is only 27%. So we do have a small population that may stay in New Jersey over the winter months, um, as long as they have food and it's not, not, don't have very long periods of uh, frost. They might stay. A pre-breeding -mi pre migration, this is when we'll see the, the bulk of them is from like April, beginning of April to towards the end of May. And that's about 100% of whatever's coming into New Jersey will be here. Uh, about 96% will be breeding. Uh, and their breeding period is usually the end of May through almost the end of July. So their young should be fledging probably in the next couple of weeks. And then almost all of them will migrate out and their migration will be um, through the beginning of November. But as I said, there is a small uh, population that may um, stay in New Jersey during the winter months. Again, this is information from eBird. 
So again, we'll do the abundance of C where they are during most of them are in, July, in January, they're down in Mexico, the Yucatan, Central, and a little bit of Colombia and South America. But you'll see them start to move in and by May, they're almost all here. And they go all the way up into Canada. And then by the end of the year, most all of them are back down into Central and South America. I love these maps. I think you can find any, almost any bird that you're interested in. You can go to eBird and get these kind of, and, and look at their uh, research section. And you don't even have to be a member of eBird. You can get all this kind of information is available to you. Uh, yellow rip warblers. I get a lot of them at my feeders during the winter. A lot of you may too. This is in their breeding plumage, but you can see they have this uh, yellow spot on their on their tail, and we call them sort of butter butts. So that's a that's a great giveaway. Even when they're not in breeding plumage, they will have that yellow uh, rump. And you know, in the winter, we have a lot of them in New Jersey. I get them in my feeders all the time. Uh, during the winter months, especially last year when we had COVID and I was, we were stuck inside. I was seeing them, um, I would say, almost all winter long, almost into April. Uh, if you watch the map, you'll see that we have them in the winter, but they go up north into Canada to breed in uh, New, New England states. And then they come back down and we get them. We're like uh, the most northern part of their uh, winter range. Uh, we got New York and Long Island, a little bit into Connecticut. So these are a warbler that's a little bit different than what we normally see. Most warblers will come in in the spring. We see them in the spring. We also see them in the fall migration. But uh, yellow rumps are here in the winter, which is our only warbler we will see in the winter. So I think that's pretty pretty interesting. And we had talked about long distance migrants. Um, some of those which we will not see are Arctic terns and they migrate from the Arctic to Antarctica twice a year. In 30 years of their lifetime, they can travel 800,000 miles. Can you imagine what their frequent flyer thing is? Now, I was wondering if they could sell me some of that. Uh, red knots travel from Tierra de Fuego to the Arctic. Um, one that they had banned it was called uh, Moonbird because he had traveled at least 20,000 miles uh, that they uh, were able to record. He disappeared about three years ago, I guess. They even have a book out on him. Um, so, um, but this year, Red Knots um, had a terrible spring here. And uh, I don't know when I, I do have something about that. So again, here's some of the pathways down, common flights, and some will come down from like Nova Scotia, uh, and they'll go into uh, Venezuela, into Brazil. Uh, one of our migrants that we have coming in is um, purple martins. Purple martins will live all in the housing that we put up for them, the, the um, uh, rent controlled housing that we have them in and they will start next month. And uh, you know, one of the people on board here uh, can maybe talk more about that, but they will start to gather at the Morris River in Cumberland and uh, Salem counties. And they will fly in mass of 20, 30,000 uh, purple martins go down into Brazil and spend the winter down there. I think it's because they're party animals and they want to go to carnival, but I don't, nobody's accepted that explanation for me. So here's something also gives you an idea. Um, in the spring, the northern uh, transect of birds from North America going into Canada, we have about 2.6 billion birds go from, North America, uh, from the US into Canada. And I guess they don't pay attention that we're not allowed, Americans aren't allowed into Canada yet, but they don't pay attention to that. But in the fall, fall migration, 4 billion birds come back. 
Uh, can anybody put in chat why they think the numbers increase like that? I'm going to put up chat. Anyone? Let's see. Good evening. Let's see. I had a couple of questions. Uh, I only see one hummingbird. Well, as I said, they're going to be coming out soon. Um, you'll start seeing them in, I guess, another week or two. Um, and they'll be at the feeders and also be at your flowers if, the, if they can get some uh, food from them. Breeding. Breeding, right. The youngsters are coming down with them. It's the same with uh, coming up from the spring, coming up from the Central South America, Mexico. We only got three and a half billion birds coming up to the U.S. where we have 4.7 billion birds going south. Now, a lot of those birds don't make it through the winter. So that's why the numbers drop off when they're coming back up. Um, they can be older birds, they just die of old age, predators. Um, we go into what, what is killing a lot of our birds these days. Um, but you can, uh, again, find this kind of information on the internet, on eBird. Uh, fall migration has already begun. Uh, in July, especially coastal birds. Uh, if you go to Sandy Hook, Island Beach State Park, Forsyth, or Cape May, uh, our, our uh, shorebirds are already starting to come back. Our shorebirds are the ones that have the longest migration of any group of birds uh, in the country. They go into South America, Central and South America, but they go up, most of the majority of them go up to the Arctic to breed. So they're going up to the tundra, they're going into Northern uh, Canada, parts of uh, Alaska, and that's where they do their breeding. They do it early because of the weather changing and stuff. And the parents leave uh, once the uh, young can fledge and can fly and uh, feed themselves. And then they know instinctually, um, it's in their DNA, how to fly south and where to go for the winter. Uh, it's also probably a good idea if parents might think about it. Once the kids eat, reach 18, you leave and you don't leave a forwarding address. Um, so that might help. Uh, again, with Osprey, they have another great way of uh, keeping their, um, their, they usually mate for life. And after the kids fledge, which is usually in uh, late August, early September, the parents leave. But the male and female go to different areas in Central and South America and Florida. And they don't see each other again till they come back up to breed in March and April. So they spend, what, six months apart. So I think that helps with a healthy relationship. Uh, oh, I digress. Let's go back to fall migration. Begins in July. Um, birds get pushed to the shoreline with strong northwesterly winds, prevailing winds. And in September, October, even early November, Cape May is one of the best places for full migration of songbirds and raptors in the world. I mean, in the world. It is really one of the great places. And you can go to the um, Cape May Hawk Watch, and there's people up there telling you what you're seeing, especially with the raptors coming through. So um, that's full migration. Full migration, if we go down to um, Forsyth National Wildlife Refuge now, um, some shorebirds are starting to come back in. Uh, greater, lesser yellow legs are starting to show up. Um, some other um, sandpipers are probably coming in soon or shortly. So how do we know where birds go? I mean, we can't watch millions and billions of birds moving around. So some of the, um, the technology that people use these days is banding and satellite tracking. So here we see Amer an American oyster catcher has got two bands on his leg. Um, he was probably netted at some point and they put the, uh, the bands on and then people report later on uh, you can go to American Oyster Catcher, just Google it on, on uh, 
online and see where you can report that you saw this bird with those um, those bands on his leg. Or if you find a dead animal, you can also report them uh, to whatever specific species that is. A little bit about tracking. I'm not an expert on this, so I'm just, uh, uh, they do have MODIS where they can put small tractors and as technology improves, the tractors can get smaller and smaller. Uh, this is a barn swallow that has a small tracker on its back. It doesn't hurt the bird. It'll eventually, um, what they use is a little tiny band, leather band around it. It will um, eventually wear out and then the tracker will fall off the bird. This was a, um, I think this is a hermit thrush. And they've tracked this. This is all the spots where a hermit thrush has been seen and they can use this radar wildlife tracking station. And then they have towers and they can, oh, this is a great cheeked thrush, I'm sorry. And um, you can see where this thrush has been uh, uh, spotted. It was all the way down in Venezuela, then it came up. Um, and it's been all along the coast here. Another one that they use, and this is uh, one that's been in New Jersey a lot recently because we've had a lot of snowy owls coming in, is Project Snowstorm. And this tracks snowy owls in North America. That's uh, Scott Widensall. He's uh, one of the main uh, naturalists working on that. And in the past seven years, they've tracked more than 90 snowy owls from the Dakotas to the Great Lakes, to New England, Southern Canada, and the Mid-Atlantic, and including their summers in the Arctic. Uh, their tracking data re reveals uh, previously unknown behaviors about the birds and sheds light on their aspects of their life. So we had, I say three or four snowy owls down here this past winter. But several years ago, we had an eruption year where we had about 30 snowy owls. But so here's a snowy owl with a tracker on it. Again, it doesn't hurt the bird. It doesn't interfere with their flying or anything. And these are spots where they where snowy owls have been have been tracked to. Uh, you can see they've been all the way down to Virginia. Now in 2013 into 14, we had a huge eruption along the East Coast and snowy owls were being seen in Florida, Bermuda, Virginia. Uh, it was just a crazy year. This year there was one in uh, Forsyth. Uh, there's usually a couple on Hallgate and uh, Island Beach State Park are usually the best places to find snowy owls in the winter. And we usually get a couple every year and then they're usually first year birds. If you can see where this, how they've been able to track them um, this is from a few years ago. So that's a great way of how um, scientists and environmentalists and, uh, can see where, the, where populations are growing or where they're not, where they're not showing up. Another thing we use is uh, bird migration radar. Uh, this was XRAD, uh, NEXRAD. Um, I'm, again, not an expert on this, but if it's not a rainy day, uh, radar at night can see, especially during migration periods, where heavy migration of birds are because it's picked up by the radar. Um, this shows you, I think these are from a few years ago, you need clean air and you can see that the heavy migration is going right off here in Monmouth and Ocean Counties. Uh, again, this is again a great place for migration. And a place where you can find it is called birdcast.info. And that gives you daily updates of what migration is going on. Again, this is part of eBird and from Cornell University. And this is what you can get. I, I did a screenshot of this off from uh, yesterday. This was yesterday at 2.30, about in the morning. Um, yeah, it was, it was, yes, it was from last, the last two nights ago. And you can see here, hot spots here, birds are migrating. And these birds are starting to come south from, from Canada. And this is along, again, we said the, uh, this is uh, the Mississippi Flyway. Not so much going on in the U.S. I mean, in New Jersey, there's a little bit of migration going on and along the coastlines from uh, Sandy Hook down. Uh, so, but there's active radar. You can get this every day if you go on to the net 
Well, uh, yeah. It's called birdcast.info. That's a good, another great place to go. And you can get this every day to see where bird migrations are going on. And this tells you where there's active radar going on. You know, we have Idaho, uh, Oregon. Of course, they're having problems with the fires out there. So a lot of birds that would normally be going down, uh, down into California and stuff are going to be moving east. And uh, I think that's why we had some migrants that last year that we don't normally see is because of the fire damage and fires that go on in the West Coast. A chat, let's see, question. Do birds give hints about bad weather coming? Hmm, I don't know the answer to that. But I know if bad weather coming, you can, especially if it comes, if there's a, like a hurricane or a nor'easter coming on, you'll find the birds are getting pushed because of the winds inland. And sometimes we get some Southern birds in, I think um, we had Elsa the other day, what was that last week? And she came up and then all of a sudden, a um, roseate spoonbill turned up in Delaware at Bombay uh, Hook. So I'm not sure if they give us hints, but they do react to bad weather coming in. And um, I know that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Maybe somebody later on can might be a little bit more familiar with that than I am. Um, hazardous hazards and population declines. I don't know, a few of you may have read in all the papers, and it was on all the television shows, uh, news programs that, over the past 50 years, um, organizations such as Cornell and other uh, fish and wildlife uh, or other uh, scientific organizations have found that over almost 3 billion birds have disappeared from North America, meaning uh, US and Canada over the past 50 years. 3 billion birds, that's a lot. Um, and some of the hazards are predators, of course. That's going to be a natural uh, thing. It, that can be other birds. It can be snakes. Um, I know they're having problems with um, coyotes on, uh, and foxes on um, a whole gate where piping plovers are breeding. Uh, gulls are a big problem. Um, outdoor cats major problem. So if you're a cat owner like I am, please keep your cats indoors. Um, lack of food. Uh, of course, the, the drought out west um, is, a, is a major problem. Uh, also, loss of habitat, lack of food. Uh, lack of habitat causes lack of food. A lot of our farmlands now are being dug up and, and changed over to um, housing or these where not so much housing these days it's these warehouses for like Wayfair and Amazon they take up huge amounts of land usually farmland bad weather um, we know that from from Sandy they were in an, in that that storm that nor'easter storm that we had uh, back in June I think we had a really bad uh, days of, of bad weather. A lot of them washed away all the uh, shore breeders that are on uh, like piping plovers and oyster catchers and other um, birds, um, lease terns. A lot of them um, breed um, little, little parts of sand and they're usually above the waterline, but if they get bad storms in and brings in higher tides, it washes away their nests. Uh, tall buildings are a problem. That's why they're trying to get, uh, especially in the big cities, to get them to put their lights out uh, during uh, the evenings. For some reason, birds are attracted by lights and they fly into the windows. Uh, cell towers and wind turbines are also a problem. I know in Long Beach Island, they're fighting one of the uh, uh, cell towers. Um, wind turbines they want to put on it, which are going to be less than 10 miles offshore. That could be a problem for our, our, our seabirds or pelagic birds uh, that fly uh, within 10 miles of the coastline. And you can see here how 
Uh, Eastern forest birds are declined by 17%. Arctic birds, of course, that's because of warming, uh, down by 23%. Western forest birds down by 29%. Again, that could be fires and loss of habitat. Boreal birds, uh, again, climate change. Shorebirds have not been have not gone down, and I don't know why that's said. And then the grassland birds is the biggest ones that have um, 53 percent of grassland birds have been lost. Okay, what's killing North American birds? Cats. This is an estimate. This is from 10 years ago or five years ago. 2.6 billion birds are lost because of cats. Um, you know, as I said, keep your cats indoors, please. Windows, that's in the total office buildings. Six, over 600, 600 million birds. Vehicles, well, cars, um, 214 million. Industrial collisions, that's uh, with the wind towers and uh, the wind turbines and cell towers. Migratory birds, 2.5 billion birds lost since 1970. Two and five Baltimore Orioles lost since 1970. I mean, these birds have been around for millions of years. They're living dinosaurs and, and, the, and 50 years is a short period of time for when you've been around for hundreds of thousands of years. 28% um, loss of migratory bird species since 70. Again, this is a decline. Another introduced species, well, their introduced species would be um, starlings. Even starlings are going down, shorebirds. Waterfowl, though, is going up. And one of the reasons is because um, uh, Ducks Unlimited, they have areas of, um, they are helping waterfowl uh, increase. Uh, land birds have decreased, water birds have decreased, uh, aerial insectivores have decreased. Um, the only thing going up is basically waterfowl. Uh, There's another one. Um, this is really important to me. That's why I'm sort of emphasizing it. Um, this is in Canada. It is in green. That was in blue. And the U.S. is in green. So if you take Canada and the U.S., that's over 600,000, 600 million birds have been lost annually because of windows and, and uh you know, wind turbines, electrical lines, cars, chemicals. Um, you know, we spray a lot of insecticides to get rid of insects, but a lot of birds eat insects. So if you get rid of the food, their food source, they're not going to have anything to eat. Uh, climate change um, is another huge, uh, it's not only affecting humans and our shoreline, um, uh, two recent reports are out there. It's uh, climate.org, uh, climateaudubon.org, and the stateofbirds.org. These links are on uh, the website um, for uh, uh, Southern Ocean Birding Group. So if you don't write it down, you can go to our website, and this information is there for you. Uh, Audubon has said out of the 588 species studied in North America, 314 species are at risk over the next 50 years of going extinct due to climate change. And we do have a lot of those birds are in New Jersey because we're on the Atlantic Flyway. And as we said before, that we get almost half of the birds seen in the U.S. and Canada are, uh, are, can be found in New Jersey. All right, so we're going to do a little bit more here. We're going to get away from some of the serious stuff, and we're going to just look at some nice pictures of uh, birds that are coming in from spring migration. All right, ringwing teal is a bird that's going to be here during the winter, and they're going to take off in, as spring migration begins. Uh, spring migration begins in mid-March, and many of them will stay in New Jersey. It peaks in May, 
A waterfowl and some raptors are already starting their way north. As I say, they go up into the tundra to reproduce. And shorebirds and warblers and passerines are on their way. Passerines, just another word for uh, songbirds. Um, from the birds that we have here during the winter, like snow geese, rigneck ducks, they're going to be making their way up to the tundra. So they're leaving us as the other birds are coming in during spring migration. Harlequin duck is one of the most beautiful ducks, and you can see them usually at Barnegat Inlet. Uh, Long-tailed ducks is a bird that you can see along our coastal areas. They're usually right where the uh, waves are breaking. So you can see them in uh, Long Beach Island or anywhere along the islands, uh, barrier islands. Surf scoters, I didn't see any of those this year, but they're another bird that's going to be heading north. Blue-winged teal, we usually get them in early spring, and we get them uh, probably in September. They'll start around being here again, and then they head south. So we only get them for a couple of weeks at each season. Uh, warblers and kinglets are starting to head north into New Jersey. Um, as I said, yellow rump warblers we'll have, and there's the yellow rump, and this is what they look like in non-breeding plumage. Uh, they'll here in the winter, but they'll be heading set, uh, north when the others are starting to come in. This is a ruby crown kinglet and a golden crown kinglet. And some of them will stay here during the winter. I know some golden crowns are usually seen during the winter if they can, because they eat juniper seeds. So they usually have a food source. Harriers and red, or raptors are starting to move north. Um, some raptors are here year round. We have uh, red tailed hawks breed in New Jersey. So do coopers and sharp shin hawks. So this is Sharpie on the right. And if you go to eBird, again, you can see bar charts. They will tell you. These are some of the most common birds we have here during the winter and the fall, uh, come in during the fall and leave. And you can see where the numbers are. So common eider, we'll have them. They're the most here during January and February. March, they're just starting to edge out and move north. By April, they're mostly gone. And then they start again coming in and um, beginning in November, the end of October, November. And you can go again to eBird and find uh, this kind of information. If you want to go out and look for birds, you want to see one that's the best chance I'm going to see that. Uh, buffle heads are here. Um, they'll come in November and they're usually here through till April. A common golden eye, we, we get them in Barnegat Bay. Um, again, they don't come until really later into J July, January, we'll get them. So this is a good uh, way of uh, seeing the double crested cormorants. We have them year round, look at them, they're here all the time. Uh, brown pelicans, they've been seen, now they're here in July. Uh, I've been, some have been coming in in June and they're in the bay now. And there are also a couple were seen down at the uh, concrete ship down in Cape May recently. Osprey. They come in in March. The males come up first, fix the nests up, get new curtains, get, spruce up the place. And then they're leaving here. The adults are leaving. And then these are the kids. And the kids might even stay around. The young might even be here through October, maybe early November. So this is, um, these are our winter birds and these are our summer birds. And you'll see like Dunlin. They might be here all winter, but they take off during the summer. They're not here because they're up in the Arctic and the tundra reproducing and breeding up there. So these are really good tools to see what you might see and when. Some early arrivals for uh, spring migration is uh, Eastern Phoebe, uh, piping plovers, the males. This is a group of three males that come in usually about mid-March. Um, Oh, red-winged blackbirds are coming in, Easterwood peewees, catbirds. I've seen a lot of catbirds recently. Osprey. When you see osprey, you know spring is coming. And they nest here, and they're breeding here. Barn swallows are coming in. Uh, woodcock will be here. You'll see them doing their mating and stuff in March, usually. 
And then you probably won't see them again until later in the fall. But they might be still here in our in our in our forests. You just don't see them. April and May, migrations in full force. Um, more species are arriving. Warblers are here. Ducks are still around. Shorebirds are coming. Uh, peak of spring and uh, migration and mating. And this is the time to get outside. Hummingbirds, as we said, we, talk, we talked about coming in. Eastern towhees are coming in in March and April and May. And then the warblers. Our wood warblers are some of the most beautiful birds. Um, they have warblers in Europe and they're all little brown jobs. We have very colorful, beautiful warblers. Uh, hard to see, they eat insects, but we do have black and white, hooded, uh, common yellow throats are pretty easy to see. They're very common, red, American red starts. Uh, we'll see them in the spring and then we'll see again, see them again in the fall. A blue gray gnat catchers breed here. And they'll be in our forest. Double trouble is a good place for them. Uh, we have warbler mania. I mean, if you know a birder, they're out in May, they're out looking for warblers and there's lots of places to find them. Um, but you see them in their breeding plumage, which is just outstanding. I mean, this is a magnolia. This is a chestnut-sided, this is a bay-breasted uh, prairie warblers. Um, just, they're just beautiful birds. Our marsh wrens breed here in the, in the spring and summer. You see them everywhere. there's some tall grasses. Palm warblers, not so much. They're, they're a little bit more rare bird to be seen. Egrets and snowy egrets will breed here in New Jersey. If you go down to the Ocean City uh, Rookery, you'll see a lot of great egrets along with uh, night herons and ibis and white ibis breeding there at the visitor center. Uh, one of the great migrations of the world happens at the Delaware Bay shores with red knots and uh, other shorebirds like um, ready turnstone, uh, least in uh, semi-palmated uh, sandpipers and the horseshoe crabs. But this year was a terrible year for red knots. The numbers dropped by at least 5,000 from last year. Uh, the reason is um, because of climate change and, and different weather uh, that we're having last year. Uh, the red knots and horseshoe crabs have been doing this thing for hundreds of thousands of years where the horseshoe crabs come up on land during the full moon in May and lay their eggs. And the shorebirds are coming in from South America and they expect to eat the eggs of the horseshoe crabs and the timing is so critical for them. And last year, the birds were here and the horseshoe crabs weren't. Horseshoe crabs didn't come up until June. But that time the birds had to leave because they have to get up north to breed and thousands of them died on the way or they didn't have enough energy to, to breed. And this year we're seeing the results of that. Plus last year because of COVID, uh, scientists and counters were not able to go to Canada or down to South America to do any research. Um, so we don't know how they did at their respective places where they either Northern or Southern areas. But this year the numbers were really really terrible. I mean, we went out looking for some and could hardly find any. Um, and this is a population that had 15 to 25,000, maybe 20 years ago. And now this year, I think there was only like seven or 8,000 we're seeing. So that's a, um, they think it could go, could be the death knell for that sub subspecies of red knots in along the East Coast. Of course, it's mating time in the spring, and least terns and laughing gulls do breed here. Um, and then we have uh, eruption years. This is a movement of birds outside of their normal range, uh, species responding to regular changes in food supply. And this usually occurs during the winter here in New Jersey, where species from the north come here to spend the winter. A few of these birds might be uh, uh, white winged crossbills. This was in the winter of 2011. This year, this past winter, we had a lot of red crossbills. I went looking for them many times and I saw none, but a lot of my, a lot of people I know did see them. 
Uh, another thing we have every two or three years, we get a good eruption of red breasted nuthatches, which we did this year too, uh, this winter, and pine siskins. And I even get pine siskins and sometimes red breasted nuthatches at my feeders. I live in a community which is not doesn't have a lot of trees around, but I know a lot of people didn't have better feeder locations than I do, and you should have these. These should have been at your feeders this past winter. A dick sisal is another um, bird that um, I understand a few people saw some this year. This, uh, some years we have more than one. Um, really pretty with that yellow chest, very di distinctive. And then, of course, uh, finding, finishing up the snowy owls of 13 and 14. Um, there was, I said, over 30 of them just in New Jersey, which was uh, fantastic. It made all the news. They're a fun bird to see. As I said, they're young birds, usually first year birds. This was at uh, Forsyth. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, some simple actions to, to wrap up that you can do yourself to help birds when they're migrating or also just breeding in our area. You can um, drink shade grown coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, but shade grown is much more uh, much better for the environment. You can reduce your plastic use. Um, that's, that's an issue for everybody. They can do citizen science and you can do that through Audubon or through Cornell. Um, there's lots of places to volunteer, do citizen science. So you can do it right at your backyard. You can just sit in your backyard and count birds. I mean, there's a way, especially through Cornell to do that. You can make your window safer. If you have win a lot of windows at your home, you can put up stickers and stuff so birds don't fly into your windows. Um, you keep your cats indoors. You can use native plants and avoid pesticides, especially Roundup. You know, don't use Roundup. So these are some simple things that everybody can do to help our bird populations. Um, you can defend and strengthen the Migratory Bird Tree Act. I understand from what I've read recently that the former administration wanted to eliminate some protections, but I think that's going to be changed uh, shortly. The, um, the Fish and Wildlife has put out uh, new rules and they just have to be adapt adopted, which should be within the next month or two. So this is not an issue, but you can call your uh, Congress people if you want to support that. Uh, Southern Ocean Birding Group, we're the only birding group in Ocean County. Uh, we meet the first Thursday every month. Uh, we're doing it on Zoom currently, and we probably will through till, um, till November. We don't meet in person. When we do meet in person, we meet at the Tucker and Seaport at the Hunting sh Shanty. Uh, we do educational programs and monthly field trips. You can find all this information out on our website, which is southernoceanbirdinggroup.org. We do a community service project, which is the cleanup of Great Bay Boulevard annually. We did that uh, in April. We did awards to uh, scholarship, scholarship awards to mate seniors. Uh, we've given over $5,000 in scholarships to seniors over the past few years. And we also conduct the annual uh, Tuckered In annual Christmas bird count, which is again, that citizen science I welcome everybody, if you're interested in birding, to join our, our group. You can just go to our website and get all the information about us. So I'm telling you to get out there and look for migrating birds during the spring and fall. Now fall is starting, so you have to go out there and look for them. And you know I will know if you do, because I am all wise. So I want to thank you all, and um, I think we'll open that up for questions. I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to look at the chat and see what questions we have. Uh, risk turbines, Long Beach Island. Uh, yeah, there is. I think the first group, uh, they're going to be put them uh, about 20 miles off the coast. And I think they worked a little bit with New Jersey Audubon on that. And I think that's probably okay. The ones that were going to be nine to 10 miles, I'm not so sure that that's going to be safe for them. Um, you know, they don't do an EIS. They don't do an environmental impact study on this. So that's uh, why I have an issue with this. I'm all for wind turbines. 
They just need to be placed in the proper place. Susan, we actually have one question that just came through. Are there eagles in New Jersey? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Eagles have made a great comeback. They're here year-round. Uh, there's almost, I want to say, probably 200 pairs now nesting in New Jersey. A great comeback from DDT, as are uh, peregrine falcons and osprey. And you can find them in every county. There's eagles in every county of New Jersey nesting. So is there an influence to the placement of the turbines or is there a way? Yeah, to um, I know people, there was an organization on, you know, on Long Beach Island um, that was fighting it. The public utilities has given them approval. Um, I don't know if they're going to do lawsuits or whatever. I'm not sure where that stands. It's hard to fight people with a lot of money. And, you know, it is what it is. Uh, they're not going to be, you know, the problems with turbines that they move slowly, but the birds flying at night, um, unless they light them up, and I'm sure the people on the land aren't going to want to see them lit up. Um, there's a, they have a chance of running into them, um, especially the, the ones that are nocturnal migrants. All right. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Support public libraries. Like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.